comes from Numbers 22, 21 through 35. It's in the Pew Bible on page 113. Opposing the Lord's will, Balaam went to King Balak. The angel of the Lord opposed him. Balaam didn't see the angel, but the donkey did, and the donkey spoke to Balaam to correct him. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, she turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat her to get her back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between two vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it, so he beat her again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat her with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would, not, but I would have spared her. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now if you are displeased, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. The New Testament lesson is found in the Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and 13 through 16. And in the Pew Bible, it's on page 850. In this, Peter warns us of false prophets and also tells of the fate that awaits them. But there were also false prophets, prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed breed. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, a beast without speech, who spoke with a man's voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Our gospel day comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 13 through 23. Please rise if you're able for the reading of the gospel. It's also, this is also found in the Pew Bible on page 685. Jesus warns of false prophets and also of false security. Hear his words and do what he says. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the, ro is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. 
Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. As soon as the reading of the lessons, you may be seated. Well, I can sympathize with Balaam a little bit, having used to farm. I had all kinds of animals around, but I'm really glad that none of those pigs ever talked back. They were stubborn enough the way it was. As Israel was marching toward the promised land, a great fear fell on all the surrounding countries. King Balak was the king of one of those countries, and uh, of Moab, and he consulted with Midian, looking for a way to defeat Israel. Everybody was afraid. They didn't know what to do, and they were all uh, feared they were going to be extinct pretty soon. So Balak sent for Balaam to come and curse Israel. And Balaam consulted the Lord, and the Lord said, No, you're not supposed to go do that. Don't go with these people. Don't go and curse the Israelites because I have blessed them. And, of course, that would put you on the wrong side of the equation. You'd be opposing me then. So Balaam didn't go. But King Balak sent more messengers, more powerful messengers, closer advisors to the king, and promises of more and more treasure, and pleaded with Balaam, please come up and curse the Israelites. And here's what Balaam answered in verse 18, even if Balak gave me his palace filled with silver and gold, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. And if Balaam would have stopped there, that would have been one of the world's all-time great answers. And we'd have had a wonderful story, and, and there wouldn't have been any war, actually. You know, all this whole thing was unnecessary because God actually had told the Israelites to go around Moab and not bother them. And then, in addition, uh, here's Balaam. He knew what God wanted him to do, and he told the messengers, I'm not supposed to do anything. I'm not supposed to curse Israel. But he didn't stop there. Balaam went on to say, I'm going to consult the Lord tonight also. I'll find out what he says this time. Well, this time, the Lord gave him permission. And we wonder, well, why in the world did he do that? God let him go because Balaam really in his heart wanted to go. Balaam was led astray by the riches, the promise, the, the promise of riches that King Balak had for him. So he went, and that then follows the donkey episode. That's kind of the background on the why King ba why Balaam was traveling. I get Balak and Balaam mixed up too, so you know I'm sure you guys would too. Uh, ba king ba K Balak was the king, if I can get my tongue untangled, and uh, Balaam was the prophet. So Balaam was going to see the king to... Uh, Supposedly, the king thought he was going to curse the Israelites, and the donkey uh, spoke some sense into the prophet, reminding him that God really didn't want him going in the first place. But Balaam finally got there, and he had Balak sacrifice animals. That was kind of standard procedure. So if you're a prophet, you know, the first thing you do is you sacrifice to get on God's good side, and then you go and listen to what God's going to tell you. So that's what Balaam did. He sacrificed. He got the word of the Lord. He came back and spoke that word. And King Balak was expecting curses to come out. And what did he hear? God's blessings on the nation of Israel, not a curse. And King Balak got really upset. And Balaam replied, didn't I tell you that I could only say what God tells me? And this happened three times. King Balak, being of the superstitious kind, took Balaam to different locations. He thought, maybe this place will work better. 
Maybe if I take the prophet over here, he can curse him over here. But he never did. Balaam always prophesied good, spoke a blessing, because that's the words God put in his mouth. And the third time, Balaam didn't even need to go and offer, offer a sacrifice. It finally dawned on him that God wanted him to bless Israel. And so he just opened his mouth and spoke as God inspired him. And then he added a fourth prophecy that foretold of other kingdoms as well as of Israel. And included in his prophecies were some prophecies of the Messiah. For instance, in chapter 24, uh, verse 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will arise out of Israel. And the prophecy goes on, and it was partially fulfilled with King David, but even more so with the Lord Jesus, the everlasting king. And so we read that story, Numbers 22 through 24, and we think, well, you know, Balaam really wasn't that bad a guy. After all, he learned from his mistakes. The donkey's message evidently got through at least a little bit. And whatever gaps needed filling in, when he sacrificed to God and got his answers and spoke those blessings on Israel, Balaam learned from it. But if we keep reading, we discover Balaam didn't learn nearly enough. We read in chapter 25 the story about how the uh, women from Moab and Midian went and seduced the Israelite men. Now, all through the Old Testament, the Israelites are warned, don't marry those foreign women. And God was not prejudiced against foreigners or anything like that, but the foreign women worshiped foreign gods. And Brought that into the household, and the Israelite men tended to not convert their wives, but go the other way. Turn and worship false gods, and that was the danger. That Israel would break its covenant with the Lord. And so they weren't to do those things. But the Moabite and Moab Midianite women succeeded in seducing many Israelites, and a plague was the result that killed 24,000 Israelites mostly of the tribe of Simeon, which if you're uh, following your walk through the Bible, you'll notice you know, there's the same number of people, more or less, at the end of the uh, desert wandering as there was at the beginning, but one tribe has only 24,000. Well, that's because they just got half of them got wiped out in this plague. So we go on to read in Numbers chapter 31. This story just kind of keeps going on and on. Israel went to war, to carry out the Lord's vengeance on Midian. Midian was one of the countries that sent their women to seduce the Israelites, brought that plague upon them. So God says, okay, Midian's going to suffer the consequences. And the Israelites went to war, soundly defeated the Midianites. And in the process, verse 8 in chapter 31 says, and they killed Balaam. You think, huh, that's interesting. I thought he went home. That's what it said at the end of chapter 24. But you see, Balaam made some stops along the way. And we read further in chapter Numbers 31, verse 16, that this whole scheme of sending all the foreign women into the Israelite camp to seduce them, that was Balaam's idea. So Balaam really wasn't as bright as we originally thought. If we just stopped at Numbers 22 through 24, we would have seen as Second Peter reminds us, that he was a false prophet. He was not there to bless Israel. He was there to earn money from King Balak. He never forgot about that offer. He wasn't in it for the Lord's rewards. He was in it for the king's rewards. In Revelations 2, there's also a mention of Balaam there. And in one of the letters to the churches, the Lord says this. To the church in Pergamum, right? These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols 
and by committing sexual immorality. So Balaam not only was after the money, but the way he did it was teaching people how to sin. And so you can see why the Lord was upset with Balaam for wanting to go, why it was so extreme that he had to have the donkey talk to him to get him to listen. If only Balaam had stopped, as I mentioned, at his first answer, I can only do what God tells me to do. He already knew God's will and God's word. And as I mentioned, all he really wanted was gold and silver. If all of us could look at Balaam, if all of God's people everywhere could remember that story of the talking donkey and remember that the whole point was not to be seduced by this world's treasures. If only we would always choose obedience over rebellion. Most of the time, we know God's will. And we may not be experts in the Bible, but most of us know the Ten Commandments. We know mostly what God wants us to do and not do, and yet we do the opposite anyway, if we're honest with ourselves. 1 Timothy 6.10, a verse, probably we all know the first part of it, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But the rest of that verse tells a little bit more about the warning and the consequences. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And so we see that money has the power to seduce us away from God altogether. If we've wandered from the faith, what hope is left for us? And Jesus himself in the Sermon on the Mount said, you can't serve both God and money. Don't even try. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. And then he promised us, if we seek the Lord, seek his kingdom and his righteousness, all that we need will be given to us. And so we don't need to worry about treasures at all. Balaam insisted upon having his own way. And that's why God let him go. And you know what? God will let us have our way too if we insist on it. God let Balaam go to see King Balak, even though it wasn't his will. And we read in Romans chapter 1 how God gives people up in their persistence to sin. If they persist, in refusing to worship him, if they persist in refusing to thank him, in refusing to recognize who he is and the work that he does in their hearts and in their lives. God will give them up. In other words, he'll let you have your way. And say, go ahead. Sin all you want to. Do whatever you feel like doing if that's what you want to do. But don't come and beg me to save you from your consequences because there will be some. That's what Romans 1 is about. And when God gives people up, they fall, and they fall hard. And then after that, people usually end up blaming God or blaming other people for their problems, when actually it's the fault of the person in the mirror. Our own sinfulness blinds us to the truth. Just as Balaam was blinded and couldn't see the angel, if we persist in wrongdoing, we can't see spiritual reality. We can't see the truth. Not just angels, but the Lord's teaching us clearly through his word. How much better then to submit to God's will and live? And in that memorable story, in our Old Testament story, God used a donkey to rebuke Balaam. A donkey, an animal. On Palm Sunday, Jesus was going into Jerusalem, and there were crowds of people, people there. Josephus estimates there's maybe as many as 2 million people would come to Jerusalem for the Passover. And many of these people were outside the walls cheering Jesus on, praising him as Hosanna, son of David. And the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were upset with that. They didn't like Jesus being called the son of David, the Messiah. And they complained to Jesus and said, Jesus, tell your disciples to be quiet. 
they're going to start an uproar and then the Romans are going to wipe us out. That was what their fear was on that day. Aside from the fact that too many people were following him. But they wanted the disciples to be quiet. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, if these are quiet, the rocks themselves will cry out in praise of me. In Isaiah chapter 1, he opens his letter, his words of prophecy, with the condemnation of the Israelites. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3, he says, The ox knows his master and the donkey his owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. And so the lesson from all these unlikely messengers, if we don't want to be dumber than rocks or than donkeys, we need to listen to God's word and cheerfully obey it. Balaam was called a false prophet. And when we think of false prophet, you know, we can almost see horns growing out of people's head and that they're teaching some terrible doctrine. But yet, Balaam didn't do that, did he? He blessed the Israelites because that's what God told him to say. And yet, he's a false prophet. They don't just always teach untruths and heresy. Caiaphas prophesied that Jesus would die on behalf of the people, which is exactly why Jesus came, to die for us. But then Caiaphas proceeded to have Jesus put to death. 2 Corinthians 11 says, Even Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And Jesus himself had some harsh words, some of which we read in Matthew 7. For instance, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. But he also, uh, so Jesus is pointing out that a person's works are just as important as his words. And we can tell a false prophet partly by what they do as much as by what they speak. How do we know? A false prophet will lead, lead you away from Jesus. Or someone who is speaking the Lord's word truly leads you toward Jesus. And if there was anything worse about Balaam than his deceitful uh, pursuit of riches, it was that he taught others to sin. I mean, it's bad enough when we do bad things on our own, but when we take others along with us, it's a truly despicable action and attitude. And Jesus had some words for people like this, too, in Matthew 18. He said, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. And in Matthew 23, verse 15, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. We all have a sphere of influence. There are people that we influence for good or for ill. Which way are we leading them? Would that our words and our deeds would always be on the side of truth, on the side of light, leading people toward Jesus. That's our goal. That's our commission, the Great Commission. Make disciples and teach them to obey what the Lord has commanded us. God created us. He sustains us day by day. He gives us everything we need for life and salvation. And even when we turn away from him, even when we go the wrong way and oppose him, still, he loved us. Jesus died on the cross for us so that we could Turn around and come back to him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, Jesus said, and I will give you rest. Rest, spirit, soul, and body. Most importantly, eternal rest. 
Let us then celebrate our salvation and not like Balaam wallow in our wantonness. Jesus died for us. Let us live for him. Amen. Continue.